In this video we're going to take a look at 3rd edition Warhammer Fantasy Battle, sometimes referred to as Old Hammer. This is the edition that was on general release by Games Workshop when I first got into the Warhammer hobby at the grand old age of 12. In this edition Warhammer was still very much a role playing game designed to be played between two or more players and a games master who would explain the narrative of the battle and also decide how the game rules would apply to any given situation. The rulebook and the accompanying armies book were vast tomes filled with information and fantastic illustrations and the focus was clearly on storytelling and world building rather than crisp gameplay. Learning the game from the third edition rulebook was quite a daunting task as key rules would often be buried amongst a wall of text and the focus of many pages was the gorgeous illustrations rather than the neat rules summaries which you will find in modern rulebooks. But for me this was part of the appeal of the game. The sense that you were slowly uncovering the mysteries of some hidden secret knowledge which allowed you to use your painted miniatures to recreate the images that you'd only previously seen in movies or imagined whilst reading books. In my opinion 3rd edition represented Warhammer at its most complex as subsequent editions streamlined a lot of the rules to make it easier to pick up for newer players. However if you are interested in the history of the Warhammer game and want a more immersive experience than simply line up your armies and roll some dice you might want to give Warhammer 3rd edition a go and see if you can master the rules. 3rd edition followed the same turn based system as previous editions of Warhammer in that one player had their entire turn and then the other player had their entire turn in sequence. Each player's turn was divided into six phases being movement, shooting, hand to hand combat, reserve movement, magic and rallying. The characteristic profile was much the same as previous and subsequent editions although newer players might notice three additional characteristics beyond leadership, these being intelligence, cool and willpower and were primarily used to deal with the effects of magic and psychology. In close combat attackers and defenders would compare weapon skills to get their to hit score which was the score they needed to roll on the d6. Keen eyed players will note that the base chance to hit for equal weapon skills is actually a 5 plus rather than a 4 plus of later editions. That made it all the more important to ensure you got the charge off which gave you a to hit bonus or arm your troops with appropriate weapons which gave you a bonus to hit against certain other troop types. You would then compare strength against toughness to work out your chance to wound the opponent. Generally speaking the tougher the enemy the harder they were to hurt with a caveat being that if the enemy had a toughness value 4 points higher than your strength you couldn't hurt them at all. Certain weapons would give your troops a strength bonus which made it that more important to make the right selections when taking on tougher foes. So for this game I've dug out my old copy of Warhammer Fantasy Battles 3rd edition and the games master has created a scenario to showcase two rival factions fighting a battle. The aim of this video is to showcase the rules in a step by step fashion and hopefully you'll pick up a sense of how the 3rd edition game played and understand how the game is designed around playing narrative battles not tournaments. This battle is going to take place in the old world, specifically the Empire. Our story unfolds in the electoral province of Middleland in the village of Fassberg. We set up a small battlefield 90 centimeters by 120 centimeters in size. This represents the outskirts of Fassberg with part of the village occupying one corner of the battlefield. In the opposite corner to the village we have a graveyard where the past generations of villagers are laid to rest. Some tangles of thorny briars occupy the open ground between the village and the graveyard and there are also a couple of low hills, one of which is crowned by the village watchtower. There is a small marsh on the same board edge as the graveyard and a duck pond next to the village. The village itself is surrounded by a stout stone wall. For this game one army will be the attackers and the other the defenders. So let's see what forces are going to be assaulting the village. The first army are the forces of the undead. In Warhammer 3rd edition there was no Nagash, there were no vampire counts and there was no kingdom of Nekara. 
Instead, an Old World undead army could be raised by any human necromancer, and take to the battlefield at the whim of their master, for good or ill. For this game, we have picked a level 5 apprentice necromancer, who is named Handrich the Scrofulous. In 3rd edition, the Warhammer Armies book states that all undead armies must be led by a wizard with one or more necromancy spells. Handrich fulfills this role. You must also take a unit of 20 or more skeleton warriors and a unit of 10 or more grim reapers. We also add a unit of 20 zombies to bulk the army out. And this brings our total to just over 500 points. In our narrative, Handrich has raised the dead of Fassberg from their eternal rest in the graveyard. His motive is one of simple revenge. Originally an inhabitant of Fassberg, Handrich was rejected and cast out by the other villagers due to his grim demeanour and evil odours. Taken to wandering in the wilds, he stumbled upon a ruined temple, and there found an ancient tome wherein he learned the secrets of how to raise the dead. After many years of study, Handrich has now returned to his birthplace to visit a terrible vengeance upon the villagers. Warhammer 3rd Edition had a unique system of character design compared to previous or subsequent editions. The familiar system of champions, heroes and lords was abandoned in favour of the level system. Characters were available at level 5, 10, 15, 20 or 25, and the number represented the amount of advancements they had to their basic profile. A level 5 character therefore has 5 increases to their stats above a regular trooper of their type. For wizards, the bonuses are given as plus 1 weapon skill, plus 1 strength, plus 1 intelligence, cool and willpower. This means Handrich's weapon skill and strength go up to 4, and his intelligence, cool and willpower go up to 8. Handrich costs 60 points, and we don't bother to buy him any additional equipment. Next we purchase our compulsory unit of skeleton warriors, a unit of 20. Skeletons cost 10 points per model, so the base cost of the unit is 200 points. We give each model a shield for the cost of 1 point per model, and then upgrade 2 models to a standard and a musician, which cost double. Total cost is 242 points. The next compulsory unit are 10 Grim Reapers, who are simply skeletons armed with scythes, which count as double-handed weapons. They cost 12 points per model, so the unit is 120 points. Lastly, we purchase a unit of 20 zombies. Zombies are only 4 points per model, so they cost 80 points, although we do purchase a standard and a musician who cost double, for a total of 88. With one army picked, and ready for battle, it's time to look at the defenders. The village is defended by an army of the Empire. In 3rd edition, the Warhammer Empire army had a strong Germanic theme based loosely upon the Holy Roman Empire. It contained none of the more fantastical elements that would appear in later editions, and there was no such thing as the Imperial Colleges of Magic back then. The Imperial nobility would be fielded as knights, whilst the infantry was made up of professional soldiers. In 3rd edition, the general must be the character model who has the highest leadership in the army. In this case, we've picked a level 5 hero who is named Graf Vogeljäger. The Warhammer Armies book states we must also take a minimum of 20 Halberdier infantry called Hellblitzen and 10 crossbow infantry called Armbrustschützen. We also add a unit of 5 mounted knights called the Staatsconnectors, and the army comes to just over 500 points. In our narrative, Graf Vogeljäger has ridden to Fassberg with his personal retinue of knights in order to inspect the local garrison, who are the halberdiers and the crossbowmen. However, upon his arrival, the villagers realise that the Graf is far more interested in inspecting the local farmer's daughters than he is his own troops. As a level 5 hero, Graf Vogeljäger has 5 advancements to his profile. He gets plus 1 weapon skill, BS, strength, initiative and attacks. This makes him good at fighting in close combat, but not much of a leader. He's armed with a hand weapon, a shield, heavy armour, and rides a barded warhorse. This kit gives him an impressive 2 plus armour save. 
His personal retinue of five Stad connectors have standard human profiles. They are armed with lances and hand weapons. They carry shields, wear heavy armor, and are also mounted on barded war horses, giving them a two plus armor save. And they come to 165 points. The unit of 20 halberdiers are equipped with light armor and armed with halberds. They are 9 points per model and have a standard bearer and a musician which cost double, so the whole unit costs 198 points. Finally, the 10 crossbowmen are armed with crossbows and wear light armour. They are 10 points per model, so they are 100 points. With the defending army now picked, we return to the undead for their deployment. Because Handrick is a wizard, we must determine his spells before the battle. As a level 5 wizard, Handrick's power level is 10, which means he has 10 magic points. Magic points will be expended every time Handrick casts a spell. He gets 3 level 1 spells, one of which must be a necromancy spell, as he is a human necromancer. His other 2 spells may be necromancy or battle magic. Warhammer Armies has the spell table allowing you to randomly generate your wizard spells by rolling a d100. We go for a necromancy spell first and roll 32, which means we get Hand of Death. This is a close combat spell and we don't really want Handrick to engage in combat. We go for a second necromancy spell and roll 76, which is Summon Skeletons. As a necromancer, this is the spell you want. For our final spell we choose battle magic and roll 21 which gives us Dispirit. And again this is quite apt for a necromancer to have. The undead player makes a note of Handrich's spells and the games master makes a ruling on the summon skeleton spell. As the wording is ambiguous and doesn't refer to any equipment possessed by the skeleton summoned, the games master decrees that this spell can be used to increase the size of an existing unit, in which case the skeletons will be armed as the rest of the unit, or it can be used to summon a new unit, in which case the skeletons will be armed with hand weapons and shields. The Games Master now decrees that Handrich's army must deploy first, on the board edge adjacent to the graveyard behind the hedgerows. The unit of zombies is deployed first, in the gap between two hedges. These are armed with hand weapons only, which give them no bonuses in combat. The standard and the musician go on the front rank. Next, we deploy a unit of 20 skeleton warriors. They are deployed behind a hedgerow at a 90 degree angle to the zombies. They are armed with hand weapons and shields, and they also have a standard and a musician on the front rank. A shield grants the model a 6 plus armor save against damage received from shooting or close combat attacks. Next, we deploy the Grim Reapers adjacent to the graveyard and these are also at a 90 degree angle to the zombies. The Grim Reapers carry double handed weapons and this gives them some advantages in combat. Firstly, they cannot employ a shield as they have to carry their weapon with two hands. They suffer a minus one initiative penalty in combat. They gain plus one strength when rolling to wound the enemy and the enemy's armor save is reduced by minus one. The units have been deployed to represent them spilling out of the graveyard at Handrich's command. Handrich is then placed at the rear of the army, ensuring that all his units are within 12 inches of him. This is because in 3rd edition, units of skeletons and zombies have to be controlled in order to fight effectively. Handrich will automatically control all zombie or skeleton units that are within 12 inches of him, as he is a human necromancer with one or more necromancy spells. Should the undead units ever find themselves outside of Handrich's control, they will become subject to stupidity. The Games Master informs the undead player that their objective is to march across the battlefield and enter the village. The Games Master sets a time limit of two hours on the game, or until one side wipes the other out. Whoever has the most troops in the village at the end of the game will be the winner. Now the quality of Handrich's troops is poor compared to the quality of the Empire troops. Despite having numbers on his side, if Handrich's army is forced to engage the enemy in close combat, they may well lose. However, in 3rd edition, the great strength of the Undead army is that all their troop types cause fear. And fear is a very powerful tool, especially as the Empire troops have no bonuses to their cool value. 
it is entirely possible that the Empire troops will simply run away from the village rather than face the undead. The Games Master now informs the Empire player that they will begin the game only with their general on the board, Graf Vogeljäger. In the narrative, the Graf has been enjoying the company of a local farmer's daughter in one of the farmhouses. However, he is rudely awoken by the screams of the villagers as they sight the undead army massing in the graveyard. Sir! Sir! What do we do? Due to the sudden shock and horror of an undead army appearing right on his doorstep, the Games Master decides that the Graf must pass a panic test in order to act this turn, otherwise he will cower in the farmhouse. To pass a panic test, the Graf must roll 2d6 and score equal to or under his cool value. The Graf's cool value is 7, so we roll 2d6. We score a 4, so he passes the test and keeps his cool. The Games Master informs the Empire player that the Graf has now mounted his horse and retrieved his battle gear. While armed with a hand weapon and mounted on a horse, the Graf will gain plus one to hit against infantry. His heavy armour, shield and barded warhorse will grant him a two plus armour save, but reduces the horse's movement from an eight to a six. The undead army now take the first turn and their troops start to march out of the graveyard. The first phase of the undead's turn is movement, where all units will get a chance to move. Looking at the army list we see that all our troop types have movement 4, which means in the movement phase each unit can move up to 4 inches. We move the units one at a time starting with the zombies, then the skeleton warriors, then Handrich, then the Grim Reapers. In each case the units simply move 4 inches forwards. In 3rd edition, as well as moving, a unit is allowed to perform one or more manoeuvres. Starting with the Grim Reapers, after moving, the unit performs a 90 degree turn, so they're now facing towards the zombies. The two models that were previously on the left flank of the unit have now become the front rank, so we rearrange them to face the zombies. Although all the models in the unit are now facing the zombies, it's more convenient for the player if simply the models nearest the zombies are rearranged to indicate the direction the unit is now facing. The Skeleton Warriors also perform the same manoeuvre, so their left flank now becomes their front rank, and we rearrange the Standard and Musician to indicate the whole unit's direction of facing. With the movement phase done, there is no shooting and no close combat, so we move on to Reserves. The Reserve phase is simply a second movement phase, but can only be made by units which are more than 4 inches from the enemy. The Zombies go first, and they move another 4 inches straight forwards. They now perform a manoeuvre and turn to their right, so their right flank becomes their front rank, and we rearrange the standard and musician to indicate this. The zombies now wish to perform a second manoeuvre in the reserve phase. In order to perform a second manoeuvre in the same phase, the unit has to pass a leadership test on two dice. When taking a manoeuvre test in this way, the musician allows the zombies to add one to their leadership score for the test. This brings the zombies' woeful leadership score of 5 up to 6. They roll the dice and score a 5. The test is passed. The zombies perform a formation change and add one file to their front rank. So the unit is now back in its original formation of four ranks of five models. So in total this turn the zombies have moved 8 inches and manoeuvred twice. Next the Grim Reapers move forwards 4 inches and then they perform a manoeuvre. The Grim Reapers perform a formation change and add three models to their front rank. So they are also now back in their original formation. The Skeleton Warriors now move four inches forward and perform a wheel manoeuvre as they do so. 
A wheel is simply a curving path measured from the outside edge of the unit. The skeletons now wish to perform a formation change, but as the wheel counted as their first manoeuvre, to do a second manoeuvre means they must pass a leadership test. The skeleton's leadership is 5, they get plus 1 for their musician and roll a 5, so they succeed. They add one file to their front rank, so they are also now back in their original formation. With his troops having skillfully manoeuvred out of the graveyard, it falls to Handrick to keep up with them. He moves two inches up to the nearby hedgerow and jumps over it. Hedges are linear obstacles, and a unit crossing a hedgerow loses half of its movement allowance. But as Handrick is a single character model, his movement allowance is only reduced by a quarter, so he gets to move another inch the other side of the hedge. We now move on to the magic phase, so it's time for Handrick to cast a spell. Because Handrich has less than 12 magic points remaining, as he only started with 10, he must pass a magic test for the spell to succeed. This is a 2d6 test against his remaining magic points, in this case 10. As Handrick uses up more magic points to cast more spells throughout the game, he will have to take further magic tests. However, provided he rolls equal to or under his intelligence, his spells will still succeed. Handrick decides to cast Summon Skeletons on the nearby unit of Grim Reapers, so he rolls the dice for his magic test. He gets a 2 and the spell succeeds. The spell has a range of 3 inches and costs 3 magic points, so Handrick now goes down to 7. The spell will add d6 skeletons to the unit. We roll a 3, so 3 more skeletons are added to the rear ranks, and with that the turn is over. In Empire Turn 1, the Games Master informs Graf Vogeljäger that he needs to reach the Watchtower on the hill and ring the bell, in order to raise the alarm and summon the rest of his troops to the battlefield. Graf Vogeljäger spurs his horse and moves forward in the movement phase. Due to his heavy armour, his warhorse is reduced to movement 6, so this is how far he travels. In the reserve phase, Graf Vogeljäger moves another 6 inches and starts to climb the hill. In Undead Turn 2, all the units simply move straight forwards 4 inches in the direction they're facing. Once again there is no shooting and no close combat. So in the reserve phase the units move again, all of them wheeling slightly towards the right. The Graf eyes their advance nervously, knowing he has precious little time before they overwhelm the village. In the magic phase, Handrich casts Dispirit at Graf Vogeljäger. Handrich has 7 magic points left, and this spell costs 2, so he's now down to 5. If successful, the spell will permanently reduce the leadership value of the Graf by 1 for the rest of the battle. Handrich makes his magic test, he needs an 8 or less as he has intelligence 8. He rolls a 5 and succeeds. Before the spell takes effect, the Graf is permitted a magic save, which is a 2d6 test against his willpower. If he can pass this test, he will shrug off the effects of the spell. The Graf's willpower is 7, so we make the roll. The Graf gets a 7 and passes the test. The spell fails. In Empire Turn 2, the Graf moves up to the tower in his movement phase, then dismounts and enters. In the shooting phase, he hastily rings the watchtower bell, and the army is summoned from the village. But will these brave men be enough to repel the oncoming undead? First to appear are the halberdiers, who are placed on the board adjacent to the farmhouse well. Their light armour provides them with a 6-up save, and their halberds prevent them from using shields although they do grant plus one initiative versus mounted or flying troops, and plus one strength. Next to arrive are the crossbows, who are deployed adjacent to the duck pond. Like the halberdiers, they have light armour for a 6 plus save. Crossbows have a range of 30 inches and strike at strength 4, imposing a minus one save modifier upon enemies struck at half range. However, crossbows can't be fired if the unit moves in either the movement or reserve phase. Lastly, the knights are deployed between the two farm buildings. 
Just like the general, their heavy armour, shields and warhorse barding provide them with a 2 plus save, although the heaviness of the armour reduces the warhorse's movement to 6. They are armed with lances which grant them plus 2 initiative when charging, plus 2 strength when charging and impose a minus 1 armour save against the enemy when charging. The Empire army has now fully deployed amongst the village. But the games master informs the Empire player that there is a sudden commotion at the doorway of one of the farmhouses. The farmer's daughter is desperately shouting at the Graf trying to attract his attention. The games master explains that the Graf must pass an intelligence test to work out what is going on. The Graf has intelligence 7 so rolls the dice. He scores a 5 and succeeds. The farmer's daughter is holding up the Graf's gun belts which he carelessly left on her bedpost as he made his hasty exit. Praising the quick thinking of the farmer's daughter the Graf once again mounts his steed and in the reserve phase begins to move back towards the village. Meanwhile the other Empire units make their reserve moves apart from the crossbowmen who are busy loading their weapons. The knights wheel forward 6 inches and the halberdiers move forward 4. But can the Graf reach the safety of the village before the undead strike? Cursing the arrival of the Empire army, Handrich urges his undead minions forward at a faster pace. In the movement phase all undead units move straight forwards 4 inches and with once again no shooting or close combat we move to the reserve phase. And once again the undead lumber forward another 4 inches. Hendrik then moves closer to the skeleton warriors and prepares to cast a spell. He attempts to use some of his 5 remaining magic points to summon more skeletons but when it comes to the magic test he rolls an 11 and fails. Andrik now only has two magic points remaining which is insufficient to raise any more skeletons. Empire turn 3 begins with the brave Empire Knights judging that they are close enough to charge the skeletons. Before they can make the charge however the Knights must pass a fear test which is a 2d6 roll against their cool. They score a 3 and pass. Having passed their fear test the knights are permitted to charge the skeletons. They can move up to double their movement which is 12 inches. This is sufficient for them to make contact. The knights are arranged in base contact with their front edge against the front edge of the skeleton unit. The graf then moves 6 inches towards the village and the halberdiers move up behind him. The crossbows stay put. If the graf can make it back to the farmhouse he can retrieve his gun belt and pick up his pistol. We now move to the shooting phase and the crossbowmen target the zombies opposite them. The crossbowmen have a ballistic skill of 3 and referring to the to hit chart that shows we need a 4 or more to hit. The stone wall doesn't block the crossbow's line of sight and the zombies aren't close enough to the stone wall to count cover. The crossbows measure the range to the zombies and find that they are within half range. Therefore no hit modifiers apply so the front rank of crossbows can make 5 attacks against the zombies. They roll 5 dice needing 4 plus to hit and score 3 hits. A crossbow has strength 4 and a zombie has toughness 3, so a 3 plus is required to kill a zombie. We roll 3 dice and get 2 wounds. The zombies have no armour so cannot save these wounds. Two zombie models are removed from the rear rank as casualties. We check to see if this is sufficient to make the zombies take a route test. A unit must take a route test if it has just lost 25% of its current numerical strength due to missile fire in a single turn. This would equate to 5 zombies being lost, therefore 2 is not sufficient to make them take a route test. We now move to the close combat phase and work out the combat between the knights and the skeletons. Both the knights and their warhorses will get to fight in this combat and blows are struck in strict order of initiative with the fastest going first. Because the knights are armed with lances they get plus 2 to their initiative when they charge. This brings their initiative up to 5 so they will go first. The knights have weapon skill 3 and the skeletons have weapon skill 2 so the knights base chance to hit is 4 plus. 
However, as they are charging, the knights get plus one to hit, so the actual score they require is three plus. The warhorses have initiative three, which is higher than the skeleton's initiative of two, so the warhorses will go next. As they also have weapon skill three and are charging, they will also hit the skeletons on three plus. We roll five red dice for the knights and five black dice for the warhorses. The knights have hit three times and the warhorses four times. The knights have a strength of three but gain plus two strength from their lance while charging, so they are strength five, while the warhorses are strength four. The skeletons are toughness three, so the knights need a two plus to wound them and the warhorses are three plus. All three of the knights attacks wound and three of the four warhorse attacks also wound. As the skeletons are equipped with shields, they are entitled to their 6-up armour save against the wounding hits. However, the knight's lances impose a minus 1 save modifier, so no saves may be taken against the lance attacks. Instead, the skeletons roll 3 dice and try and save against the warhorse attacks, as they impose no save modifier. The skeletons roll 3 dice needing 6s and score 1 6. They've saved 1 wound. In total, 5 skeletons have been killed by the knightly charge and this is sufficient to wipe out the entire front rank. Ordinarily this would prevent the skeletons from fighting back at all, but the game's master rules that as the knights didn't specify they were targeting the skeleton standard bearer or musician or unit leader, these models are permitted their attacks. The skeletons have weapon skill 2 and the knights have weapon skill 3, so the skeletons require a 5 plus to hit. They roll 3 attacks and score 2 hits. The skeletons have strength 3 and the knights have toughness 3, so the skeletons require a 4 plus to wound. They roll 2 dice and score 1 4 plus. One wound is caused on a knight. The wounded knight is allowed to make his 2 plus armour saving throw. He rolls a 2 and his thick armour prevents the skeleton's blow from wounding him. The combat round is now over and we calculate which side has won. You score one point for every wound you've caused on the enemy that wasn't saved by armour. You get plus one to your total if you charged, and plus one to your total for every complete rank behind the first rank fighting. If a unit has a standard, this adds another plus one. This brings the knight's total to six as they caused five wounds and charged, while the skeletons score three as they have two complete ranks behind the first and a standard. The skeletons lose this round of combat and are automatically pushed backwards two inches by the knights. The knights decide to stay in combat so automatically follow up the skeletons as the skeletons retreat. Ordinarily, the skeletons would now have to pass a route test as they've just lost a quarter of their unit strength and have been pushed back in a round of combat. However, skeletons are an exception to the normal rules in that they never take route tests. They can never be forced to flee for any reason and will continue fighting until they are all cut down. Instead, skeletons are subject to instability. And when defeated and pushed back in combat, instead of taking a route test, the skeletons take an instability test. This is a simple d6 roll on an instability table. And the skeletons roll a 2. The skeletons have lost some of their magical animating power and as a result will not be able to move in their following turn. They also suffer minus one to hit for the rest of this combat engagement. We put a dice next to the unit to show this effect. And the combat phase now ends. In the reserve phase the halberdiers move forwards to the edge of the wall and the graph finally makes it back to the farmer's daughter. The games master informs the empire player that the graph is now equipped with a pistol, which is a powerful ranged weapon and is also useful in close combat. At the start of their turn 4, the zombies declare a charge against the knights who are engaged with the skeletons. Because the zombies cause fear, the knights must pass another fear test. The knights have a cool value of 7, but they roll an 8 and fail. This means the knights will now automatically rout away from combat due to the charge of the zombies. When a unit routes from close combat, it's immediately turned to face directly away from the enemy it's fighting. The routing unit is then moved at double pace directly away from the combat. In this instance, the knights flee straight through the unit of halberdiers which are behind them. 
the rout of the knight causes all friendly units within 12 inches of the combat to pass a panic test. The halberdiers go first, they have a cool value of 7, but as they have 4 times as many models in their units as the knights do, they gain a plus 1 bonus to their cool. They need an 8 or less and roll a 6, so pass. The Graf goes next, he has a cool value of 7 and rolls a 7. He passes. Luckily for the crossbows, they are more than 12 inches away from the combat, so do not have to test. When a unit routes from combat, their enemies are permitted to make a free hack, as the fleeing unit turns their back on the enemy to run away. Each model on the front rank of skeletons lands an automatic hit on the knights. All they need to do is roll to wound. However, the skeletons can only manage a single wound as the knights turn to flee. The fleeing model is not permitted to use a shield to make an armour save, so the knight's armour save is reduced to 3+. plus. They roll a 3 and save the wound. The zombies attempt to redirect their charge into the halberdiers, as the knights are no longer a viable target. But this requires a successful leadership test which the zombies fail. They are now stuck with their flank exposed to the halberdiers. Because they failed a charge, the zombies also count as being unformed, which means they must remain stationary while they reorder their ranks and cannot move in the reserve phase or their next movement phase. Meanwhile, the skeletons that were fighting the knights can't move in this movement phase, so they're prevented from chasing the knights and striking another free hack. The Grim Reapers are free to move, so they wheel round adjacent to the wall. Handrich elects not to move this turn as he wishes to enter a trance and regain one magic point. In the reserve phase, the Grim Reapers move forward another four inches and make a manoeuvre to turn to their right. They then attempt to change formation and increase the size of their front rank, but fail the leadership test. At the end of the turn, Handrick automatically recovers one magic point for resting. He now has three magic points, which is sufficient to summon more skeletons. In Empire Turn 4, the Halberdiers prepare to charge the zombies. They have to pass a fear test on their call of 7, but they roll an 8 and fail. The Halberdiers are now frozen in fear and cannot move further this turn. The Games Master rules that the Graf has just sufficient line of sight to see past the Halberdiers towards the zombies, and he is permitted a fear test in order to charge them as well. The Graf also has call 7, but he rolls a 5 and is successful. He charges straight into the flank of the zombies. Meanwhile, the knights continue to flee towards the board edge. As they're still moving at double rate, their move allowance is sufficient to take them clear off the battlefield. And ordinarily, this would mean they are out of the game without a chance to rally. However, as the board is so small, the GM rules that any fleeing unit from either side will halt at its own board edge and will remain there until it can take a rally test in its rally phase. Therefore, the knights stop at their own board edge. In the shooting phase, the crossbows can draw line of sight to the skeleton warriors. The front rank of crossbows fire at the skeletons, who are just outside of half range. This means the crossbows need a 5 to hit. They score 2 hits. Two of the hits wound, and the skeletons must make two armour saves. The skeletons fail both their armour saves and the unit loses two more models. In the combat phase, Graf Vogeljäger has initiative 4, and his warhorse has initiative 3. The zombies only have initiative 1, so they will go last. The Graf has a weapon skill of 4, and the zombies have a weapon skill of 2, so he normally needs a 4 plus to hit. However, the Graf gains plus 1 to hit for charging, and another plus 1 to hit, as he has a hand weapon, and is mounted on a horse, attacking infantry. Meanwhile, the Warhorse has weapon skill 3, so normally needs a 4 plus to hit, but gains plus 1 for charging. The Graf has 2 attacks in combat, and requires a 2 plus to hit. The Warhorse has 1 attack, and requires a 3 plus. All 3 attacks hit home. Both the Graf and his Warhorse have a strength of 4, which against the Zombie's toughness of 3, requires a 3 plus to wound. 2 of the 3 hits wound, which means 2 Zombies are removed as casualties. This leaves no zombies left in base contact with the Graf to fight back. We then calculate who has won. The Graf has caused two casualties and has charged for a total of three. The zombies have caused no casualties but do have a standard for one. They cannot count their rank bonuses as their front rank is not engaged in combat. 
the zombies have lost combat and are pushed back two inches by the graph. Ordinarily the zombies wouldn't need to take a route test as they've yet to lose a quarter of their unit. However this unit of zombies is currently still unformed as it failed to complete its charge last turn and if an unformed unit is pushed back in combat it will route automatically. This means that the zombies route directly away from the graph and they move at double pace. The graph decides to give chase and pursues the routing zombies. The graph is also permitted to move at double pace and he easily catches the routing zombies. Both the graph and his warhorse are permitted to strike all their attacks as free hacks as the zombies run away from them. They get one set of free hacks as the zombies turn to run and another set of free hacks as they chase the zombies down. The first round of blows sees two zombies fall under the hooves and the hammer of the graph with a second round of blows seeing three more zombies perish. An entire rank of zombies has been cut down as they rout. Because of a rout from close combat, any friendly units within 12 inches must now make a panic test. Skeletons are immune to psychology so they don't need to take the test, but Handrick is a human so he does. He has a cool of 8, he rolls a 5 and passes. At the end of the Empire turn is the rally phase and the Knights are permitted a rally test against their leadership in order to stop running off the board. Their leadership is 7 and they roll a 6 so succeed. The Knights turn around to face the enemy once again at the board edge. But the skeletons are fast approaching. In the undead turn, Handrick once again decides to rest to recover magic points. The skeleton warriors declare a charge at the vulnerable flank of the halberdiers. The halberdiers have to pass a fear test which they promptly fail and turn around to flee. They move at double pace and end up running straight into the knights who have just rallied, blocking their way. The skeletons give chase but cannot catch the fleeing halberdiers, so they come to a halt and are unformed. Meanwhile the zombies continue their route towards their board edge and they continue to move at double pace. The Graf takes this opportunity to end the pursuit of the zombies and passes a leadership test to do so. A unit which halts an ongoing pursuit in this manner is normally unformed, but as the Graf is a single character model the Games Master rules that this condition will not apply to him. Elsewhere the Grim Reapers perform a formation change and prepare to clamber over the stone wall. In the reserve phase they enter the village, and Handrick having regained another magic point is now up to 4. The zombies meanwhile continue heading for the board edge as once zombies start to rout they cannot rally. At the start of their turn 5 the Empire Knights have to pass a panic test due to the halberdiers fleeing in front of them. They roll a 6 and pass. Meanwhile the halberdiers continue to flee and would leave the board, but the games master rules they are allowed to halt at the board edge and take a rally test this turn. Effectively this means they stay where they are, blocking the knight's line of sight. In his movement phase Graf Vogeljäger turns his horse to face Handrich the Necromancer. In the shooting phase the crossbowmen take aim at the nearby Grim Reapers. If the crossbowmen are within the skeleton's charge range then they'll have to pass a fear test to shoot them. However the games master rules that for the skeletons to legally charge the crossbowmen they would have to wheel first and the outside model is more than 8 inches away. This means no fear test is required so the crossbows lose 5 shots at the skeleton scoring 3 hits. The 3 hits roll to wound and 3 wounds are scored. 3 grim reapers are removed as casualties. Graf Vogeljäger now confronts Handrich the Scrofulous. Why are you doing this? Oh, you want to know? Because the answer's easy. I'm bad. And you're good. You're goody little two-shoes. You're goody little two-shoes. Two-shoes. <laughs> Realising that the necromancer is clearly insane, Graf Vogeljäger draws his pistol and puts him out of his misery. He needs a five to hit and a 3 to wound. I ain't that good. 
with the necromancer taken out, the Empire now have a real chance of halting the tide of skeletons. With no close combats and no reserve moves to make, we move to the rally phase. The halberdiers take a rally test and must score equal to or under their leadership on two dice. They need a 7 but score 9 so fail. The games master rules that the halberdiers have now left the board, and the knights have to pass another panic test or be swept up in the rout along with the halberdiers. With a call of 7, the knights must score 7 or less on two dice, and luckily for them, they make it. In the movement phase of Undead Turn 6, the zombies continue their inexorable route towards the board edge, but the games master makes a special ruling that even though zombies cannot normally rally once they route, when they get to the board edge they are permitted one rally test. Because the skeletons are no longer being controlled by Handrick, at the start of their turn they must make a stupidity test. This is a 2d6 test taken against the skeleton's cool value of 5. The skeletons get a 7 and fail the test, so they now roll on the stupidity table. They score a 6. This means the skeletons can do nothing else this turn. The Grim Reapers also take a stupidity test and also fail. They roll a 2 on the stupidity table and wander off in a random direction. Ironically this takes them straight back over the wall that they've just climbed. With the undead attack now faltering, all the Empire need to do is master their fear and drive the undead from the village. The Empire Knights must pass a fear test to charge the skeleton warriors. They have a cool of 7 but roll a 9, so fail. Flushed with victory after dispatching the Necromancer, Graf Vogeljäger succeeds in his fear test and charges the skeleton warriors in the rear. In the shooting phase the crossbows attempt to hit the Grim Reapers who have climbed back over the wall, but as the Grim Reapers can claim hard cover for the protection of the wall, all the crossbows miss. In close combat, the charge of Graf Vogeljäger on his warhorse succeeds in striking the skeletons twice and inflicting one wound. The skeletons fail their save. One skeleton fights back but misses the Graf. The Graf has caused one casualty and claims one for charging, for a total of two. The skeletons can claim one for their standard only, for a total of one, so they lose combat and are pushed back. This causes the skeletons to become unstable, and as they have no controller then instead of taking an instability test, instead the skeletons are automatically destroyed. Clearly the Graf is showing his men how it should be done. In Undead Turn 7, the Grim Reapers take a stupidity test, and against the odds they pass. In the movement phase they turn around and prepare to climb back over the wall. Meanwhile the zombies have reached their own table edge, so they halt there and get a chance to rally in the rally phase. The Grim Reapers climb back over the wall and re-enter the village. There is still a chance that the Grim Reapers will be able to scare the Empire troops out of the village and claim victory. Meanwhile the loss of their necromancer is clearly too much for the zombies, who fail their rally test and flee off the board. In Empire Turn 7 the Graf and his knights decide to bring the skeletons within charge range. The knights wheel forward between the houses whilst the Graf turns around on the spot. In the shooting phase the crossbows fire at the Grim Reapers once again. They score 3 hits and two wounds. Two more Grim Reapers are removed as casualties. In the reserve phase the knights move ever closer to the skeletons, hoping that they've kept clear of the skeletons charge range. In Undead Turn 8 the knights are actually just within the skeletons charge distance, so the skeletons try and charge them. However the skeletons fail their stupidity test and once again they wander off in a random direction, trying to climb back over the wall. In Empire Turn 8, the knights pass their fear test to charge the Grim Reapers, and so does Graf Vogeljäger. The knights will go first, then the Graf, then the warhorses. 
the skeletons go last. In the combat phase the Graf manages to take out the two skeletons on his side of the wall and the knights and war horses destroy three more. With the five skeletons in contact with the enemy dead they can't fight back. The Empire have killed five skeletons and have charged so they score six and the skeletons score zero. The skeletons are pushed back two inches and have to take an instability test which means they are destroyed as they are no longer controlled. With all the undead forces now removed from play the Empire are victorious. The village is saved. The Graf and his men then search the battlefield for any remaining undead. But the graveyard is now empty once again. Curiously the body of the necromancer Handrich the Scrofulus cannot be found. The Graf does however recover the necromancer's leather bound book of spells which he puts under armed guard in the watchtower. And finally the Graf's army return to the safety of the village to look for the missing halberdiers and to find some pleasant company. Give me some sugar baby. And so the battle has come to an end with the forces of the Empire being victorious on this night. However if the Graf had failed just one of his fear tests the outcome would have been very different. Although the outcome appears very one-sided, if the Empire had not been so lucky with many of their fear tests, the undead would certainly have easily scared the humans out of the village without ever having to enter close combat. But tonight the Graf celebrates his good fortune, although he has a nagging feeling that this is not the last he will see of Handrich the Scrofulous.